Recently, Dave Verwer, who you may know from the great newsletter iOS Dev Weekly, he conducted a giant survey of iOS developers, over 2,300 of them, asking things like, you know, how much money did you make this year, you know, building apps? What kind of architecture are you using in your apps? You know, what, do you, what dependency manager are you using? You know, Swift or Objective-C? All the nitty gritty iOS developer questions did a survey, again, of over 2,300 people. And we're gonna review the highlights of that in today's video. So here we are at the website. As you can see, data collection happened over four weeks, you know, from December, 2019 to January. And again, 2,300 roughly uh, people answered the questionnaire. So I'm gonna tell you about this website real quick, and then we're gonna go into some of the highlights. Uh, so as you can see, Dave is giving some analysis and opinion. He's doing little write-ups based on the data. You know, is augmented reality uh, going to happen? How popular is Swift? You know, more analytics are on the way, so more stuff is coming. So be sure to check back on the website. And you can just dive into the raw survey results yourself if you like. So for example, you know, tap on your career and you can see uh, the results of the survey. Like how long have you been involved in creating apps? More on that later. We'll, we'll talk about that in the highlights. I do like this question down here at the bottom. Uh, how much income have you earned from creating apps in the last 12 months? So you can see the bulk of it is in that, you know, 100 to 150,000 range, which, you know, depending on where you live, it's a pretty standard uh, iOS developer salary. But then you do get this, you know, 0.7% uh, or 14 responses, more than a million. So for those 14 people, <laughs> good for you. That's awesome. And then another nine, 500,000 to a million. So, uh, you know, things could go well. But again, you see the typical salary ranges here. So that's kind of the kind of stuff that you can dive into. Uh, like I mentioned, we're just going to talk about the highlights. And to do that, we're going to talk about a tweet thread from Josh Avant. Uh, as you can see, Josh Avant here, uh, you know, former Apple, Microsoft, Google, Tinder. He helped make iOS 4 through 5. So he's been around a bit, knows this stuff. But he put out a great tweet thread kind of giving his his takes on some topics as he was reading through the survey. So go ahead and give Josh Avon a follow. Uh, we're gonna use this thread as kind of a, a guide through our highlights. All right, first up here, uh, we talk about architecture, everybody's favorite topic, right? Uh, so 68.3% of business code is plain old MVC. So that's definitely dominant. You see some MVVM, definitely no slouch there at nearly 50%. The coordinator pattern, uh, almost 30%, but uh, you see mostly MVC. And, to be quite honest with you, like th these architecture questions that I get asked, and I'm sure a lot of people get asked all the time, like, what's the best architecture? What should I use? Like, I don't know. That's like one of the questions I'm the most sick of hearing. Basically, like, use what works for you. I use MVC the vast majority of the time. Uh, MVVM is also popular as well. But uh, here you can see what over 2,000 people responded to and what they're using. So next up. Uh, and Josh says, I so wish this was asked the same question, but for objective C, basically how satisfied are you with the Swift programming language? And you can see most people, eight, nine, and 10, the average was 8.3, a little bit of a seven, and then the rest kind of meh, one through six. A little side note, and if you're familiar with Tim Ferriss, you know, you have probably heard this before too, but he talks about these one to 10 scales and don't let people say seven is, is what he thinks, um, because seven is, and I kind of agree. It's like seven is kind of a cop-out answer. I'm like, eh, it's okay. It's not great. It's not bad. It's like a cop-out, right? Whereas if you say six, that's like a bad signal. And if you say eight, that's like a good signal. So by not letting people answer seven, you're kind of removing that cop-out meh answer. I don't know. I kind of I kind of like that philosophy. I don't, I don't think Dave's going to implement that, but I think it'd be kind of interesting if he did. You kind of force people to choose like good or bad. Anyway, a uh, little side rant there. Uh, so Josh says, it seems like a lot of people, himself included, got swept up in the initial excitement of the iPhone and turned it into a career. So I have a, I have an opinion on, on this data here. So you can see most people between three and 15 years, that's the bulk of what people make up. So that's kind of what Josh is saying. Like, you know, is the developer community, like he says it hasn't really grown since then, right? Cause you have all these people that have been doing it here, but not a lot down here. So I get his logic, right? That would seem that like new people aren't coming in. But my opinion, and I'm speaking, you know, my firsthand experience here, I didn't join the community, if you will, right? Get on Twitter, start interacting with all this stuff until I was like two and a half years into my career. So I bet a lot of these people, especially like less than six months or six months uh, to a year, one, they may not even know about the community or Twitter or these kind of surveys. Two, they may not feel like they know enough to contribute. So I believe there are a lot more developers out there uh, than this data show so anyway i think this is skewed a little bit just my opinion would love to hear your thoughts in the comments but again i know people just learning out typically aren't in community you know participating in this kind of stuff even though some are uh all right next up i love this one 
Tech debt is an HR problem for sure, right? Like the very first thing here, 89.5% of people say the quality of the code base they work on uh, impacts their job satisfaction. I'm sure we've all experienced this where you you know, either join a new contract or, or join a new team and the code base is rough, right? That's not a good experience. I know when it happened to me, it was just demoralizing. Like I, I didn't like I didn't want I wasn't excited to work on the project. Or vice versa though. If you go into a great code base, well documented, very clean, easy to read, easy to reason about, that's a joy to work on. So when you're building your code bases and you're writing that code, remember like the overall quality of that code base is extremely important. And then of course, 63%, you know, working remotely or from home is important to my choice of job. I think that's becoming pretty standard. You know, even if it's not full remote work, you know, the work from home days on a regular basis, I think are important even for those that go to an office uh, every day. So this is interesting based on current events here. Only about 15 to 70% of dev actually care about going to WWDC. A lot of people just like to treat it as a virtual event, which again is interesting because, you know, the coronavirus is going on. Uh, Google and Facebook have already shut down their conferences. People are assuming Apple will as well. They haven't announced it as of yet. So this is likely to be like a virtual conference for everybody this year. So I'm super interested to see how they handle that but uh i went to my first wwdc last year i didn't have a ticket but i still went and hung out for a couple days i had a blast you get to meet and and talk to people that you've been interacting with on twitter uh i don't know i just had a ton of fun i highly recommend going at least once but i get it it's expensive it's not a cheap trip um and you can get a ton of value just watching the sessions uh, it seems like that's what most people do here Next up, uh, UI kit. You can't escape it. Uh, so basically, what technologies have you been shipping you know, with your iOS apps? 99% almost UI kit. A little bit of Swift UI. Core data numbers surprised me because, again, I've talked to a lot of people. Not many people that I've talked to like use it. And if they do, they kind of have a little bit of horror stories. But uh, I don't know. It appears this, this number surprised me. So I don't know if... I would love to hear comments again if you can enlighten me on this uh, a little bit. But back to the whole UI kit and Swift UI thing. It's it's clear that Apple is trying to make Swift UI and Combine kind of the future of how you know we develop apps. Of course, that future is going to take a few years to unfold. So as iOS developers, we're in a transitionary period where, in my opinion, I just think you're going to have to know both UI kit and Swift UI. Right? Get a lot of questions. Which one should I learn? I just think for your own benefit, you're going to have to know both. Kind of sucks that you have to learn two things, but uh, again, Apple's in a transition period, so it's the way it is right now. Moving on, uh, TV OS is a platform primarily for TV-centric companies. Makes sense, right? The Netflixes, the Hulus. Looks like not a lot of people are developing uh, in TV OS. Uh, Swift on the server, AI and AR all have vanishingly small business market share. Uh, years in, Apple's just not getting substantial traction with these yet. I think the yet is a a good thing to say because it's still very very early uh, even though it is a couple years in still early right like ar in my opinion ar doesn't even have a chance to take off uh until you get glasses right nobody wants to hold up their phone or their ipad to see the ar experience uh i'm not saying ar is going to take off when we get glasses but that's when it even has a chance to and that moves on into this AR uh, question here, um, basically saying a lot of people are is not important to them. But like Joss mentions here, uh, although I bet sentiment would change with a dazzling, capable product launch and matching consumer demand. So let's talk about that for a second, right? So, you know, it's no secret Apple's working on AR glasses. Uh, I think it can go two ways, right? I think it can go the way of the Google Glass, which is kind of just niche fad, kind of fizzles out, nothing comes of it. Or I think it can go the way of AirPods, right? If you remember when AirPods were first launched, everybody made fun of them. Everybody thought they looked stupid. Like they were just like the joke of the internet. And now here we are. It's like the best selling product of all time. Everybody loves their AirPods. So I don't know, maybe Apple Glass will be the same thing where when they first come out, it's going to be the laughing stock. Everybody's going to joke. And then a year or two later, you know, everybody will have them. So We'll see. I kind of hope that happens. Uh, I don't know. I think it'll be fun, but uh, we'll see. Obviously, nobody wants it to turn out like Google Glass. Um, this is interesting, too. Uh, Josh points this out. The greater than 100% sum of the responses seems to indicate there are lots of code bases that have a mixed UI development approach. If you've been following me for a bit, you know that's how I typically do my projects. A mix of storyboard and programmatic. Again, I, I just believe that storyboards are advantageous in certain situations. Programmatic is more advantageous in certain situations, and I kind of use the right tool for the right job. Of course, I have code bases that are full storyboard and code bases that are full programmatic. Uh, so back to the whole like UI kit and Swift UI thing. My answer to this is, you know, storyboard versus programmatic. Uh, you just need to know both. I don't know. That that's my opinion. It's it's fine to have a, a preference on which one you like to use and which one you prefer. 
But uh, I don't know. I think you should definitely know how to do both as a developer. Next, we have uh, you can try to escape Xcode, but you'll inevitably get pulled back in. So 99.3% of people use Xcode to develop their apps. I've heard of people using things like AppCode, Xamarin, or whatever, and I've only heard horror stories. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure there's positive, good stories out there. I just haven't heard them. So if you do have a positive experience with something other than Xcode on like a, a large app, not like a side project, uh, I would love to hear that. Um, back to, now we're on to uh, dependency managers for third-party libraries. So Swift Package Manager at almost 20% is pretty surprising since SPM is relatively new and, you know, CocoaPods dominating is no surprise. CocoaPods was like the standard for a long time. And, but I do think we're going to see Swift Package Manager like overtake CocoaPods in time. My opinion, and I think the opinion of many, is that Swift Package Manager is going to be the normal way we do this. And then like CocoaPods and Carthage will turn into like, yeah, we used to do that back in the day, but everybody does SPM. That's what I think is going to happen. An interesting side note about this survey, and I hope Dave does this because uh, it looks like he's going to do this every year. I would love to see year over year percentage change, right? For example, I think it's pretty obvious we're going to see Swift Package Manager take a lot more market share, if you will, of the dependency managers. And I would just love to see these year over year percentage changes. I think that'd be super interesting, not just on this uh, data, but like all, all the data. Um, keeping on the topic of third party libraries, uh, it says more than 10, the number of more than 10 responses here is very disturbing. And I agree. So 30% say they have more than 10 third-party libraries in their app. That, that's a lot. I just checked before I made this video, Aluna for the, the startup I'm working on, uh, has seven, I believe. And, but like three of those are like Fabric, Crashlytics, our Zendesk uh, customer service. Um, so there's not many that actually like, you know, I couldn't have coded uh, easy. But yeah, most apps have between five and 10 and more than 10. So there you go. And next we have something uh, interesting that I never really thought of. It says, wow, Google has their fingers in a lot of iOS apps. Like I just mentioned, Aluna is using Crashlytics and Fabric, which most people do, as you can see. Uh, but they're owned by Google. So Google has, you know, data and insights uh, to a lot of iOS apps. So that's... Uh, like you said, that has to give Apple some anxiety, probably. Again, I thought that was a pretty interesting point there. Um, this is a cool topic too. Uh, you know, what is a reasonable cut of revenue uh, for Apple to take, you know, from the App Store, right? They take the 30% now or 15% of a subscription if it's been over a year. But uh, it seems most developers think between 6 and 15% is fair. I... I don't know. I don't really have an opinion on on the percentage. I, I would love to see, and somebody else proposed this uh, like a while ago. I can't remember. I would love to see some sort of tiered fee structure where uh, something that's advantageous to like the independent small app developer, right? Because 30% of your revenue is a lot <laughs> to be taken for any company. But I just, I don't know. I would love to see Apple foster more of the small independent app developer to be able to make it on the app store. Like I'm not saying I have the answer, Whatever that may be, I would just would love to see again that uh, that kind of innovation. Those because like it's those small indie developers that always make the quirky, cool, fun apps, and I think I think that's kind of going away. And I would love to see a resurgence of that. So those are the highlights of the survey. Again, back to the website. I would definitely dive in yourself. All these uh, analysis articles, also the raw data. And again, I really, really hope Dave does this next year. And my one recommendation, maybe I'll tweet at him. He probably already has it in his plans, but. Year over year percentage change uh, would be super interesting to see uh, if and when he does this next year. So hope you enjoyed the video. See you in the next one.